Okay, uh, welcome to panel number 26, uh, Getting and Using Data Acquisition. Um, my name is Mark Crisco. I am the Principal Deputy for Data and Analytics in the Office of the Undersecretary for Acquisition. Um, I work for Ms. Skeen and uh, Mr. Cadman, and we work on, there's really two things that I have. Um, uh, the couple of things that keep me up at night and, and I work on relative to data is working to make sure that the acquisition data is there for senior leadership, steward the services and components to make sure that we have authoritative data for that. And most recently, and you've probably heard a bit of it, depending on what sessions you were in, uh, efforts underway under the Acquisition Innovation Research Center. Uh, I've enjoyed a long history, uh, probably way too long, with the Navy Postgraduate School, and I find this forum absolutely remarkable um, for getting ideas, uh, assisting the students, and, and pushing the department into the next generation where we're using data. And the focus of this, this panel is on just that. And you are going to see a breadth of very distinguished speakers and, and very comprehensive products um, in various lanes of acquisition. Uh, I always like thinking about it as big A, that there's many components. So everything from procurement data, all the way looking to deliverable associated with data. And uh, this is just a wonderful event. I've read the research. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, and we have three speakers, actually four, but One's doing two. Uh, David Gill's going to kick us off here, and I, I will have each one of the presenters um, introduce themselves and give a bit of their background. Um, Dr. Charles Picard and Chip will be working from an effort from the Navy Postgraduate School and Nick Haas from uh, MITRE to, to kind of clean it up. Uh, we will have a question and answer session as associated with this, and I would certainly, I know we're in a virtual environment and there's no place on the world I'd rather be but in Monterey right now. Uh, please put your questions in the question and answer. Uh, I will be moderating them and directing them. And if you have somebody in particular you'd like to uh, address, uh, please let me know and we will do that. But without further ado, uh, David, I'd like to hand it over to you for your introduction. Over. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm David yeah, thanks, Gill. Uh, I work at the Internal Revenue Service in the the Analytics uh, Research and Technology Division. Um, I, I used to be a contracting officer, but now I've moved into a role as a procurement data scientist and researcher. Uh, Charles Picard, I'm uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School. Uh, I'm a senior lecturer for uh, project management and systems engineering. My research interest, along with my colleague Chip Frank, Dr. Chip Frank down in Texas is uh, schedules and using acquisition data to focus on the red-haired stepchild of acquisition, which is schedule the thing that nobody really pays any attention to. Chip. Hi, I'm uh, after 33 years in the Air Force, I went to the uh, Naval Postgraduate School where I had a wonderful time for 12 years. Uh, I'm now living in Texas, as Charles said, and I've had the privilege of working with great collaborators and co-authors like Charles Picard. All right, Nick. Hey, Nick Haas, coming from Huntsville, Alabama, Redstone Arsenal, uh, with MITRE for about four, four years now. And before that, about 20 years of uh, contracting officer with the Air Force, with the Army, with the Corps of Engineers, and a little stint with Boeing as a contract negotiator. All right. Well, welcome all. Um, before I hand it off to you, uh, Dave, I, I want to make a couple observations. Old contracting officer here, both things are true, old and former contracting officer. I, I find that contracts as a discipline within acquisition really helps um, help me understand the breadth and of the department relative to acquisition, because we got to see an awful lot. So I'm, I'm really glad Dave and Nick, that you, you have some heritage there uh, in the Air Force as, as well as uh, what you've done, Dave. And I will tell you, Dr. Picard and Frank, and Dr. Frank, people do care about schedule. 
it is one of the hardest things to worry about. And this past week when Mesquine, when we were with her, we were talking about schedule. How do we, how do we fix that? How do we better understand that? So um, I'd like to turn it over to you now, uh, David, and uh, please give us your presentation and talk to us about your research and your work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, my first presentation is on using data analytics to detect bridge contracts. And this is research I did with Professor Tim Hawkins and uh, data scientists Robert Carlson and Jinsu Elhans. And a, a bridge contract is uh, a non competitive stopgap contract or modification that is intended to avoid a lapse in service. Um, and while there's the benefit of having the contractor continue working, uh, there are some downsides in that it circumvents competition and that the government may not be getting uh, the best pricing or, or the very best solution. And uh, the next slide I'm gonna show, uh, there was a GAO audit report. It, it was several years back um, that was really the government's biggest study on bridge contracts, uh, included definition for bridge contracts. And th this GAO audit, even though it's several years old, uh, it still has open audit recommendations. And one of the issues is uh, a difficulty in uh, identifying bridge contracts and uh, just a, a lack of data to see trends where their bridge contracts are going up and down. Uh, th there's a few agencies that, that have processes for, for self-reporting bridge contracts, uh, but not all agencies have that. And there's no uniform uh, government-wide reporting of bridge contracts um, in, in a system like the federal procurement data system. And uh, there's a lot of dollars out there that are going to, to bridge contracts and we wanted to get a sense of um, how often that bridge contracts were occurring. And in our approach was uh, to use analytics to find the bridge contracts. Uh, if you're familiar with a federal procurement data system contract action report, uh, there really is enough data if you're able to connect all the dots uh, to show you here's a bridge contract or bridge modification, uh, but also here's the original contract uh, that preceded that bridge contract. And if you can tie those two things together, uh, that's the smoking gun that shows you have a bridge contract or a bridge modification. Um, so the, the research questions that we set out to answer um, are how prevalent are bridge contracts and then are there any discernible patterns uh, in, in bridge contract use? And that's on, that's on slide three. And we, we use some pretty advanced analytic methodologies in terms of, well, one, natural language processing. Uh, I mean, the easiest case for us, if the contracting officer puts in the description of requirement field that it's a quote unquote bridge contract, our job is made a lot easier. Um, but that's not always the case. Uh, uh, we're not going to rely on a freeform description field to find our bridge contracts. So um, in, in addition to the, the language and descriptions, we applied some other techniques. And one of them is, is graph network theory. And networks have to do just simply with things that are connected to each other. And for this problem, um, not all short-term sole source contracts are bridges. Um, it, it, for example, there's some software vendors that will not give you future year option pricing. Uh, so the agency is stuck with short term sole source contracts, but it's not due to a lack of advanced planning or protests or some sort of emergency that you have to implement a stopgap contract to bridge the gap. Uh, so the network being able to connect the bridge contract with the predecessor contract was really critical uh, to have incredible results. Um, and, and then third, the, the machine learning approach where we would take data, historical data on known bridge contracts, and then use that to train an algorithm 
um, on what are the, the key defining characteristics of a bridge contract and then the original contract that came before it. Um, these are the analytic approaches we, we use to detect bridge contracts. And now the, the methodology, um, so like I said, the network natural language processing focuses on the descriptions typed in by the contracting officers. Uh, with, with the networks or a graph database, you've got nodes and edges. This is really just fancy terminology for circles and lines to represent the different contracts. Um, and then we have machine learning algorithm, uh, a random forest, and uh, that algorithm is really just a bunch of decision trees. And the decision tree can factor in um, different metrics or different characteristics of the contracts um, that lead to an ultimate decision or classification on whether or not it's believed to be a bridge. Um, and then we had actual documents like uh, sole source justifications, JNAs uh, for certain IRS bridges, and, and the Navy was nice enough to share uh, some of their bridge contract reporting with us. And, and that was used as a source of ground truth. Um, and so what that means, there's possibility that the programming in our algorithm, we could have fat fingered something. Maybe we don't know what we're talking about. The algorithm could be highly inaccurate and way off. So the ground truth, the, the hard proof is the sole source justifications, where it's explained the acquisition is a bridge, here's the circumstances, it's a signed official document. Um, and the, the features that we entered into the model and our idea that, hey, all this data is already in the federal procurement data system. We just need analytic approach that, that can connect the dots uh, we had the, the thought that the bridge contract is going to have the same vendor, the same fund, funding office, and, and be chronologically sequential. If the original contract ends today, the bridge contract is going to start tomorrow or pretty soon thereafter. Um, the bridge modifications, uh, some slightly different characteristics. Uh, I mean, they're going to have the same PID, but you'll see that the the contract is going to be modified beyond the original ultimate completion date. So the, the results of our analysis, uh, we, we have some statistical charts uh, from our machine learning approach on slide five. And, and we have a chart showing uh, in descending order of importance, the, the most important data features. And these are really just data elements um, derived from the federal procurement data system that helped us detect bridge contracts. Um, and then on the right is, is a confusion matrix that shows uh, how often our model was able to correctly identify bridge contracts. And in some instances, what the model thought was a bridge contract wasn't actually. Uh, slide six, you get the same statistics, but the difference is it, it's for bridge modifications. Then um, the, the key findings, so the, the analytic approaches we used were, were helpful, but they were not perfect in, in terms of detecting bridge contracts. Um, we, we only discovered um, 15 bridges, uh, we, we know a lot more bridge contracts are out there, um, but there are just some barriers in terms of like, like our skill and um, combining the graph database with, uh, with the machine learning. And, um, and there's some computational barriers too, because uh, we were kind of on a, a wild goose chase uh, for the predecessor contracts. So each time we, we found a, a short-term sole source contract or what we thought might be a bridge mod, we had to go searching through a bunch of different contracts uh, to see if, you know, gee, is this a match? Is this the contract that came before? And can we connect all the dots? Does it make a compelling story of predecessor and bridge? Um, so we are comparing an awful lot of contracts with each other and that was computationally intensive. So we didn't get to run it on the entire government's data and find a massive number of bridge contracts. But, 
but we do think they're out there. Um, the, the best features uh, and most effective in identifying bridge contracts, uh, the period of performance gap uh, is really key. Um, I, I mean, it's just a mission critical thing that the last thing you want is, is a lapse in service. Um, so awarding another contract to the, to the very same vendor almost immediately after the, uh, the original contract ended. Uh, I mean, that, that's one of the telltale signs, uh, but, but you really can't look at just one feature. Uh, you have to look at many different data points to be able to come to uh, the conclusion confidently that, that you found a bridge. Okay, so uh, are we holding questions to the end? Uh, We're, given that we're all virtual, you're gonna to have to give me a clue when you're ready to stop. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm gonna warn the other panelists. I, I, I think I get this job because I'm a bit of a wild card. I have a bunch of questions and yeah. I can see the attendees that went from 18 to 17. Remember, I'm the data guy here, so I know who you are. Uh, I would expect questions, a few questions from the audience, but I do have a few, David. Um, sure. And uh, because I think it's important that we have a dialogue about this stuff. Uh, there are two things, two things that struck me. Um, one, you were former KO. You mm -hmm. moved on to the data and analytics side. Yeah. What took you on that yeah. path? Uh, it, it was a weird uh, path. I was writing our, our FAR supplement, our far, and our supplement. someone decided, and someone decided uh, my procurement policy experience qualified me to be uh, – tax refund fraud program manager. Um, I, I got bad grades uh, and the little bit of math I took, they gave me PhD mathematicians. And I did so bad with uh, the tax fraud machine learning that they, they threw me out of Washington after, uh, after my boss got called into a congressional hearing um, and sent me back to procurement. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I'm better with machine learning now. So, yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, as, as I was listening to you, there were a couple things that I was, you know, it's just not the lexicon of the FAR or in our case, the DFAR or the procurement community. Uh, you use terms like, uh, uh, network machine learning, random forest, natural language processing, um, you said the data was there and the question, you know, the question I have really is that you've now garnered different skills as somebody who was a subject matter expert in contracts and policy and that procedure. Yeah. Um, given that we probably have a few people that are pursuing procurement or acquisition, what advice would you have them? How would they use these tools and techniques as a part of their day job too? How would they benefit from the research and, the guidance that you can share with them. Yeah. So uh, one takeaway is that using techniques as machine, such as machine learning, we can get the answer answers to certain questions without having to send out a data call to all employees, without having to wait for the thing to happen. Uh, sometimes we can predict it in advance, or or find things that are not explicitly labeled in a predetermined format in, in a database. Um, another example I, I give of that is uh, there's a push for uh, greater environmental sustainability in our contracts. And uh, I took a non-traditional way to audit the, the IRS contract compliance with the environmental policies. I said, man, we don't know nothing about this stuff. We do taxes. We don't know. Um, I took the FPDS data from the Environmental Protection Agency. I said, they're going to know this stuff. Um, they're not very often putting not applicable for environmental stuff when EPA awards a contract. And it, in doing that, yeah, it took a little sophistication, but the output was simple. They said, look, here's a spreadsheet of our IRS contracts where maybe oopsie daisy, we forgot to include an environmental requirement in FAR Part 23. You know, I, I found uh, those needles in the haystack. It turns out there were a lot of needles in that haystack. Um, and, and you don't have to go through every single contract file or do something in a very uh, human labor intensive way when you, sometimes you can use an approach like machine learning and, and get to an answer or something that helps you with a procurement goal. Yeah. 
I, I think that's great. And I'm going to punch up a couple of things so I can let you get to the next one. Um, but once again, I do want to challenge the audience because I still don't see anything in the Q&A. And I'll call on you because I got names next to me uh, up here too at some point. But I think there are a couple things. I mean, if you're in the audience, I mean, that's the reason many of you go to Navy Postgraduate School. I will also say of the Back to Basics program at DAU, uh, where you can learn about the tools, techniques, and strategy, whether they be data and analytics or on-hand training, I would certainly encourage everybody to do that. The lexicon and models are changing so rapidly that we could take advantage of it. Maybe we could make it a little bit easier, a, a whole lot more efficient because we have an awful lot of data. So, David, thank you for the first one on the first one, but I think I hand it right back to you again for the next one, correct? That's right. Me again. Right. Okay. Uh, so my, my next presentation is on making federal financial data more reliable with emerging technology. Uh, my my co-authors, uh, there's Avram Ibrahim, who is behind a lot of the, the data science and the intelligent automation that's going to be featured. Uh, Umar Chaudhry, uh, who's a procurement lawyer and uh, uh, I believe he's a, a professor or lecturer uh, at the George Washington University. Um, Sonia Jolly, an IRS CFO. Um, and, and last but not least, the, the IRS is director of uh, procurement uh, analytics, research and technology, Alicia Miller. Uh, and we got some goals handed uh, down from Congress in terms of uh, consistent, reliable, and searchable federal spending data, be it for contracts or grants. So in 2006, there was the, the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. And, and President Bush said uh, he wanted this to be like a Google search um, on federal spending for, for taxpayers and the public. Um, and the FIFADA Act was expanded in 2014 with the DATA Act, which is an acronym, the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act. And uh, one of the key goals of the DATA Act is to improve the quality of the data uh, that we're reporting. Um, uh, on slide three, uh, the, the DATA Act resulted in annual inspector general audits uh, in my agency, and I think this is true at, at other agencies too. And uh, so this is the, the fiscal year 2020 data act audit for the, for the IRS. Um, and it's kind of the problem statement. While we made some improvements to data quality, um, the inspector general highlighted the, the areas where our data quality has uh, still more room for improvement. The sort of the highest error rate data fields uh, are, are shown on this slide. Um, so you'll see a number of fields around um, place of performance, where the work's located. Um, that's a pretty important field in terms of congressional reporting, uh, because if this information is wrong, then there's not a lot of confidence in uh, here's how many dollars or jobs that are going to this state or, or this district. Um, there's some other fields that like the uh, current total value of the award, uh, period of performance, a potential end date, which is the ultimate completion date, um, and the some entity identifier fields for, for the vendor. Um, these fields could be broadly bucketed into uh, dollars, addresses, and dates uh, associated with, with the contracts. And there's similar reporting also for grants and financial assistance. Um, so we had implemented some solutions to help make our look for internal inconsistencies in our FPDS data and, and to really scrub our structured databases. But uh, a key advancement we made, which is on slide four, is that we're actually going through contract and modification documents, not me, but my intelligent automation bot is going through the documents. Um, helping to fish out information. And you know, sometimes we use a standard form, a standard form 30, a 1449, a standard form 26. Um, and some of this stuff is in a predictable location, but 
Uh, other times, it's just a habit of contracting. There's some pieces of information uh, that also get reported to FPDS, and they could be anywhere. Uh, place of performance is one. It just in my agency, it's like randomly inserted somewhere in the SOW or PWS, hopefully. Um, our standard form 30 for modifications has a free form description field where you describe why you're doing the modification, sometimes how much money you're adding. Um, and the contracting officer can write that in any sort of format, uh, which is a tricky thing for um, a computer to understand. So um, our approach was to use a very sophisticated AI approach. Um, we, we used uh, deep learning and specifically the, the BERT model, which it's a mouthful, it's bi-directional encoder response transformers. Uh, but basically this is a state-of-the-art model for language understanding. And we understand that uh, different contracting officers are gonna write things slightly differently. So, so we fed the, the deep learning algorithm a bunch of our IRS contract documents. So it would get a sense of the common language uh, that, that's typically used. Um, you know, let's say there's 20 different ways that, that my contracting officers will write place of performance. Um, and, and, you know, they might use that term, but there could be very slight differences. And th this, this algorithm helps um, the, to find where that information is and extract it and put it in a very neatly organized format. Um, the, the next slide is going to explain a little bit more about our emerging technology um, approach. Um, I, I mean, hey, there's just a lot of transactions. Uh, th that's why we want automation. We, we just don't have the staff to uh, manually audit a whole bunch of different data elements and compare a contract against the FPDS database. Super tedious, super boring, super time consuming. Um, so we brought a couple of things into the solution. One is the robotic process automation. So this RPA bot will actually log into my contract writing system, go in a deep dark corner where we keep our contract and modification documents within a system. It will authenticate into the system and download the contract and modification documents. So, I mean, access to the documents, uh, that was a non-trivial challenge. Uh, once it, the bot has the documents, then that's where the deep learning comes in to extract, gee, what's the place of performance, the, the action obligation, um, and all those other data elements. Um, and the, these technologies were, were key. Uh, we really needed to conjure up a virtual auditor that could do um, what our inspector general was doing each year with, uh, with their human auditors. Uh, because they would get us every time the auditors would come in, pull out the contract document, and say, that don't match what's in FPDS. Um, so we had to get ahead of that. And this technology was, was our means of doing that. And so, so he, here's the, the output from the solution in, in a table. And this is like an application we have in the, the Amazon Web Services Gov Cloud. This is where the, the deep learning lies. Um, so it looks like pretty close to the same stuff, but the key thing is um, the first column is information actually extracted from the contract document. Um, the second column of values is what we reported to FPDS for that PID mod, that contract, and if there's any modification number on it. Um, so this allows us to do the comparison and, and to be very meticulous. Um, uh, I mean, we've gotten audit findings around, we had the first five digits of the zip code right, but the the last four digits and di zip codes have nine digits, uh, were either not there or they were wrong. Um, it, so the bot, it doesn't get bored. It'll just go through this stuff in a very meticulous way um, to check whether it matches exactly, uh, which is the standard that we're audited on. And uh, the, the use of this intelligent automation uh, bot um, has helped us. Um, is, so it's automated tedious work, uh, verifying the consistency of uh, contract dollar amounts, dates, addresses. Uh, and 
uh, even our inspector general, uh, I think, gave us a high compliment in saying our, our data quality they now believe is excellent. Um, and, and I don't hear that word a lot from my inspector general. So uh, I think that's it's telling. It's not it's not perfect. We, we still do have some issues. Um, but uh, th there's information that can be relied upon. We, we've made great improvements, uh, for example, in our obligation data, uh, which of course is real money. And you know, Congress and the public can have confidence in, in that our obligations are, are, are timely and accurate and complete. Um, and, and this is kind of additional benefit. So it, it's, it's not just about government employees. Um, part of the, the legislative intent behind the Data Act um, is open contracting data, making it available to the public. And it, data is, is so critical for, for researchers, really, I think, in any professional field. And so here I've given a few examples, and, and they just run the gamut um, from diplomacy, education, public health, uh, where different researchers have uh, uh, use the open data on federal contracts and grants, and, and that's been really instrumental to their studies. David, there's a couple. There's two questions from uh, John in the audience, and John, if I paraphrase these incorrectly, um, please help me and tell me whether I got it right or not. Um, first, he said it was a great presentation, and he's very grateful for that. And yeah. um, and. I think for everyone, utilizing FPDS as a data source uh, is critically important. I'll add a little bit here. It matters to make sure that those that are filling that out, whether it's in your contract writing system or even if you're stubby penciling it, that you get your data right. Um, we, don't, we don't have the staff to do that and, and tools and techniques are emerging to do that. So one of the questions John has is, you know, you were using tools in place are you making those tools, and, and this is much more operational, maybe beyond the research side of this, um, did you put the tools in GitHub as an example? Are they available for other people to build upon this? And I, I've lost a little bit of track on the procurement side of whether your operations and methods and actually even code or techniques is going into a central repository. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's a great question. So um, th this solution was really like developed by by a small business and there's some intellectual property stuff. Uh, I, I mean, I was able to get the code. Um, my cybersecurity office gave it the cavity search. Uh, um, it, there was there's a lot of like IT reviews and um, before we could deploy the solution. Um, uh, but but I mean yeah I think source code sharing is, is important I mean there, there's code.gov it's the the federal open source policy um, I, I do have code for like other projects uh, that are in the space of procurement analytics uh, that, that that I wrote um, and there's no like trade secret restricted computer software type issues on it and, and I'm starting to put uh, some of that out in GitHub um, it, it's it's a cultural challenge. Um, it, it just this spring, the, the White House did a, a federal artificial intelligence inventory canvassing agencies. Sometimes they got very little response back. Um, I think I was the only one at my agency that would like pony up some source code in the, in the public. Uh, so I do have some code out there, I think for uh, another project I mentioned around um, uh, doing an audit, like the, the environmental FAR Part 23 compliance uh, uh, for, for your contracts. Uh, there's some examples like that. Um, it, it, it'll get you up and running with machine learning. You might be interested in that problem. You might be interested in repurposing it for a different problem. Yeah, I uh, just to build off of this, and you know, I get the privilege of being the moderator here. Um, when we did things like this, um, we were using FSRS, we were using FPDS, and we were having to crosswalk that data. One of the things that I insisted, and it's it's a small scale, one that we would own the intellectual capital, so not in GitHub, I made them document the code, whether it be in R or Python, their methods, as well as their operations. And we just hung it on our website so we could share it. And I think 
as we move into a data and analytic world, uh, you know, when you think of the federal government, when you think of department scale, it's hard to have one central repository. But I think as we think about sharing it, uh, we they are products in and of themselves. And owning them from our perspective, and because we want to, I've, I've been a zealot of trying to own the intellectual capital on our side of the equation in the federal government, not just on the proprietary. Um, a bit of follow up from uh, John in the audience here. Um, how did you manipulate, or what tools did you use in the manipulation of missing data, and uh, how does that work? What did you do? Um. I, I mean, if the data is, is missing, but it's required, I, I mean, that, that's obviously going to be an issue on the audit. Um, so one of the things that, that all the IGs look at is like completeness. So you could have issues like um, you didn't enter the record into FPDS uh, or you, you fat fingered something and it won't let you approve the FPDS. And, and that, that could be a reason for missing data. But uh, we really didn't go down the road of imputation for this project. Okay. All right. I'm going to go off. Uh, thank you. I'm a, you know, Nadine's giving me the hook here to get myself going. I, I could probably spend the afternoon with you here. So uh, let's go over to Dr. Picard and uh, Dr. Frank. Thanks, David. We'll try to get a little bit of time back and uh, tail end. Hi, I'm Chip Frank, and I'm the first end of the tag team uh, here. Um, this is our, we've been working on est estimating schedule durations for uh, uh, quite some time now. And uh, um, we note that this has been a vexatious and major issue um, going back at least to, to 1962 in Peck and Schur. And we're trying to make some progress on it and hopefully we can get it uh, off the research, the ex researchers uh, to hard pile. Uh, I'm going to talk about why we're interested in getting better data and exploiting perhaps some of those emerging, emerging technologies that David talked about. Um, there are a lot of things that complicate schedules, uh, external factors, although there's been some good research on it done cited here. Problem is that policy regimes and funding climates can change over the course of a major program. There are external shocks. Uh, and uh, to include things like uh, litigation, like regionally happened on Jedi, uh, that can throw schedules off. And in addition to that, acts of God, such as the hurricanes that delayed the Coast Guard Cutter program. Next slide, please. Among a part of our side questions in this inquiry was to take a look at really simple models of, of uh, programs and as you can see, this one is ridiculously simple. Um, for the purpose of saying, can you make a simple problem complicated or a simple program complicated in terms of making predictions and so forth? Next slide, please. I may have to switch to telephone. Well, I'm no longer unstable, that's good. Um, one of the things that came out of this was that they, um, uh, given that there's a program manager making decisions in our little model, um, the, that uh, uh, you end up with things like trade spaces in the execution of the program. Now, what this little diagram tells you is that we have uh, two levels of performance fix. The numbers aren't really important and they're explained in our paper. Uh, and we have cost versus schedule. Uh, if, for example, performance is set at 100, then you notice that um, depending on how you prioritize schedule versus cost, uh, you get different outcome. So for example, on the um, this point right here, uh, we, this is results from the program manager emphasizing uh, cost over schedule. And you get low cost and you get a longer schedule. The other end here, uh, the uh, program manager emphasizes schedule over cost, more cost, 
plus expect time to run the program. The point is that um, things are going on in the program that you do not know ex ante, like the guidance given to the program manager or the way the program manager makes those JSIDs macro outcome trade-offs involving cost, schedule, and performance. Next slide, please. Uh, there's also the issue of incentives. And uh, I've been struck by how much the manner of incentives has popped up in this program. Perhaps that's because I'm an economist and I love to hear that word. But um, so for example, um, to get into a program, you have to be optimistic about it. That is to say, if you want to be innovative and you're launching a program, uh, you're very optimistic about completion. Um, so this is called the planning fallacy as a fancy term. Uh, second, and now we're into hardcore in, um, incentives here, more optimistic promises mean that you are more likely to win the contract. And so therefore the optimists are incentivized to be optimistic. And even if you're over-optimistic after source selection, it becomes harder to enforce those promises you made during the courtship called source selection. And the fancy term for that is the fundamental transformation of the relationship between the government and the contractor. Next slide, please. And now over to Charles, who's going to talk about how we're in more detail, how we plan to address these problems. So as <clears throat> Chips pointed out, we've been looking at schedule for a number of years. And frankly, uh, while we haven't exhausted all the different angles to address, we have uh, looked at it from obviously the economics perspective, as he just mentioned, to system dynamics. And one of the things that is totally apparent and will come to no surprise to any member of this audience is that schedules are uh, complex and it is a very difficult problem. And schedules in and of themselves, I would argue, are more complex uh, than money or cost. Now, obviously, I have a certain degree of prejudice uh, to this particular topic uh, could, compared with my uh, colleagues that look at cost. But the point is that schedules are complex, and therefore we need to look at complexities. Next slide, please. Defining, finding, measuring, and addressing schedule complexity is, is really central. Now, uh, there are any number of institutions in the United States throughout the world, for that matter, that study complexity. And frankly, uh, for those of you that have ever looked at uh, any of that research, uh, it is, apart from being complex, it's very difficult to understand. What we're trying to do is look at the data that we have available in the acquisition databases and figure out a way of extracting data to measure complexity while accounting for the complexity of the data. Next slide, please. Stephen Book, the late Stephen Book, uh, an expert in uh, schedule, uh, noted these truisms, fundamental truisms, that there are differences between dollars and time. Uh, obviously, that's no comes as no surprise. But I do want to emphasize it mainly under the topic of why does it matter? And it matters in managing a weapon system development program, any program for that matter, because with money, you can move it around. And as someone who's done this uh, for a living, I can tell you that is really great and often very fulfilling when you are able to forestall difficulties and in some cases uh, even potential failures by being able to shift resources around. Time is a resource that you can't really shift. You can't take time and give it to something else. Now, I say that theoretically, in, in reality, of course, there are ways around that. But I point that out because that leads to and contributes to the complexity that we're talking about. And so my argument is, is that while we pay extreme attention to cost, and in fact, we are generally laser focused at cost. If you look at the acquisition databases throughout the DOD enterprise, 
uh, and whether it's in what those databases that uh, Mark runs in the uh, Dave environment, whether it's in CAPE, whether it's in the services, cost is a central factor. I'm not complaining, it's important, but we also need to look at schedule. Next slide, please. Time is more complex than money. And the way I talk to my students about this and the way that I think about it is that a weapon system development program is a system with inputs and outputs. It has interdependencies and the schedule is that dynamic unstable metric in this dynamic unstable system. And so therefore we have got to get our arms around it. The work we've done in the past, Chip and I, and other colleagues have looked at how these interdependencies work, how they are influenced. A more recent uh, effort focused on identifying what we call scheduled delay factors in an attempt to identify those things, those activities, and potentially even those processes that are causing uh, the scheduled delays that we're talking about in an attempt to perhaps either be able to get our arms around them in a lessons learned perspective to provide that back to the community for something to watch at, to ultimately uh, going down the path that David was talking about earlier, uh, create artificial intelligence based tools that will allow us to look out and look at what's actually occurring inside a development and potentially warn of factors as they come about. Next slide, please. Schedule complexity uh, is and has been uh, researched across the board, and I just have this chart. Go ahead and uh, advance one, please. Uh, and go ahead and just build it all in. Uh, the structural uncertainty, dynamic, social, political uh, are the broad categories. Now, this is my uh, assessment of the literature and extracting those that uh, are perhaps uh, better focused on the whole idea of schedule complexity, structural being those things that are in the system. I would argue, by the way, that structural includes the administrative uh, running of the developments that we're trying to uh, build and includes things like, to go back to the contracting officers, the former contracting officers uh, on the uh, stand here, uh, the number of pages in a contract can significantly increase the complexity of a contract. Build one more, please. All this in the context of a system, then, are things that have to be accounted for. So next slide, please. So uh, if you look at the literature and the dimensions of complexity, and obviously I'm not going to go through this, uh, they are available uh, to look at, but essentially we start and focus with uncertainty, as I mentioned before. Uh, there are difficulties associated with the performance of the work of the project, in other words, uh, the technology. Interdependencies and the relationship between various things actually happening in the project, to include the social-political side of people working with people, uh, materially affect the uh, schedules, uh, as well as just simply the number of activities planned. Next slide, please. So therefore, what we're trying to get to is, is figure out in the acquisition data what it is that we can use. Now, in previous research, we've gone through selected acquisition reports uh, in a very a basic fashion to identify both the actual time uh, that schedules were being delayed, as well as a, a very great effort to discern uh, what was causing those delays. The challenge, of course, with selected acquisition reports, as with most of the data associated with schedules that are in the databases, is, is this is analog data. This is qualitative data that uh, does not easily lend itself to quantitative uh, analysis. And so part of uh, this effort this particular year that Chip and I have been pursuing is identify ways to, first of all, identify what the data is across the entire uh, data enterprise, uh, 
uh, for schedule, and then come up with the tools. Uh, obviously, we're since we're talking qualitative rather than quantitative data, they have to be qualitative tools. We've identified and procured the tools, and our next step in our effort is to apply the qualitative data analysis tools that we have to the existing data to be able to uh, come up with a way to measure it, because that fundamentally is the challenge of how do we measure schedule complexity uh, through looking at the data. Next chart, please. This is uh, a basic complexity assessment tool after uh, something done by uh, Hans Tomheim. The parameters that you see on the side are a combination of schedule delay factors that, uh, that we've identified as well as some of the things that Tomheim uh, originally back in 2014 uh, published. It needs work. I, I'll be the first to admit that. And I go back and say, because complexity is really hard, the idea and where we want to get to is to come up with a complexity index. And if we can come up with and identify a complexity index that stands up under uh, good solid analysis, then I think we're going to have a tool that can help us better focus on the actual management of the schedule in the context of the weapon system development. Next chart, please. So, in closing, the things that we do in the Department of Defense to develop weapon systems, and when I say weapon systems, I mean literally just about everything that we do in the Department of Defense, are inherently complex, whether it's the technology to the number of pages in the contract, to the number of people, to the level of the, of the sophistication of the people that are working on the contract, and they make it as just more complex than it possibly can be. One of the things that we found, though, and one of the uh, get-off-the-stage ideas that I would like to leave with you is, is that the data that we have on schedule is analog-based. It is reporting that was required since we started reporting on defense acquisitions. It is not and does not lend itself currently to the... Uh, quantitative approach to really better understanding not only what's causing the schedule's changes, uh, both good and bad, by the way, but also the actual impact of the schedule changes. Uh, we want to explore whether different data, and this is obviously more work that we need to do, uh, we hope to use the qualitative data analysis tools to help us identify that as well. And then finally, uh, what we're trying to get to is a better way to predict. Ultimately, we believe that this can lend itself to an AI-driven tool. Uh, obviously, the machine learning that David talked about is uh, essential to uh, that kind of a tool, but ultimately a tool that can be in a PM's toolbox uh, PM leadership team's toolbox to include even chief engineers and so on that will alert them to when there are problems, but something that's going to be uh, based in very, very strong science, uh, backed up, obviously, by uh, very strong data. The bottom line is, is that schedules can make things fall apart. I'll leave you just with one thought by uh, from a PM that shall remain nameless. Uh, on a 60 Minutes interview a number of years ago, one of his people said to him, uh, they've installed the valve backwards, and so they're going to have to stop and redo what they've done. Re classic case of rework. Um, he was very focused, obviously, on who was going to pay for it. Uh, when uh, Chip and I had an opportunity to talk to this particular gentleman, we asked him, so, but what was the impact on the schedule? And, for, and his response was really quite interesting. The impact on his schedule was it increased that simple act seven months. Done. All right. Uh, thanks, Chip. Thank you, uh, Charles. Um, in the event of time, I want to hand it over to you, Nick. I hope you're fully loaded and, and go so I can give you your 15 minutes here. Thank you. Yep, I'm ready to go. So uh, I'm going to talk briefly about, we talked about a lot of good information today so far, talking about data and how to compile it and the analytics and the schedule. And so one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, 
how to do an independent assessment on what it is that you have and how to get there from a, an A to Z, you know, this is a, you have a technical data package. What if you don't know what you have? Uh, and so this is just gonna be a, a real quick rundown on how to get there so you know what right looks like. So here's the agenda. Uh, we're gonna talk about the background of what this independent assessment looks like, uh, the milestones relative to the TDP and the acquisition schedule. Um, assumptions and constraints when factoring in, uh, the phased approach so as we went through and delivered this, uh, this product to our sponsors, um, considerations, assessment findings, and recommendations. So he, the background, uh, MITRE conducted a review of a current legacy technical data package. The, the legacy data package was a 20-year sole source for this particular uh, example um, that we applied this, this model to. So 20 years in source selection, major weapon systems, uh, R&D. Uh, I know 20 years in R&D seems like a long time, but it's really not. Um, and uh, so when they were gently told to go competitive and they needed to go out and do a, a uh, FAR 15 full and open competition to, to, to you know, start, uh, they were gently asked to compete. <laughs> um, they needed help knowing what they had. Uh, as we discussed earlier in this panel, you know, the technical data packages are a wide range of documents. Um, it's, it's, it could be system design documents. It could be specifications of specific components. It could be overarching command media when you're talking about a, the program management plan and configuration management plan and so forth and so on. So what we were tasked to do as, 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 a, as a team was, we were told, tell us what's right. So we came in and we analyzed all the documents. We compared the technical data package artifacts to DOD guidance, 3100B, MILDEP, and uh, agency guides that were available uh, within that uh, infrastructure that we were working. Um, and then we also interacted with the functional leads to categorize and compartmentalize the artifacts. Um, then at the end, we compiled the analysis of all the documentation. Uh, and we broke it down in a way that was usable and uh, able to be compartmentalized and utilized in the source selection environment uh, at the RFP process when they were uh, putting together their package. So. so here's a little, just a real quick rundown of, these are the uh, areas where technical data package documentation and artifacts could be updated throughout that process. So obviously we started our assessment of the requirements way before um, the market research in R5 was posted. Uh, we, it took us about three months to go through uh, and look through all the archives and, uh, and, and get all the um, documentation that we could find uh, based on um, the, uh, the functional leads for the sponsor that we were assisting uh, as they were going through and trying to give us what they thought they had. And uh, so, but to, to, to highlight this chart though, the areas in green show um, periods of the acquisition process where you are able to update that bidder's library. Um, and then in the blue section is when the, uh, the government acquisition actions take place and it's no longer that, that technical data package is, it can no longer be um, tinkered with due to you know, possible uh, protests and, and, and you, know, you don't wanna, at a certain point throughout the RFP process, you don't, or the source selection process, you don't wanna, you don't wanna uh, keep tinkering with all your documentation. So here are some assumptions and constraints that we utilized. Uh, some of the things that we did was we made it very clear to our sponsor that we will not provide artifacts, which became, um, we did not provide the artifacts, which became part of the bidder's library. Uh, we did not create or edit any of the artifacts that were reviewed, and we were not responsible for the configuration control of those artifacts. Um, it's so important because for it to be a true independent assessment, we have to come in, we have to look at you know, what it is that they have, and then if we have to, um, to give a clear you know, assessment of where they need to get to based on our recommendations. Uh, as with any independent assessment, it's a, it's a good idea to identify constraints. Uh, just so that it's, it's, it's highlighted for uh, any uh, AAR actions or, or things of that nature. Um, so obviously COVID was a big deal uh, when we conducted the last assessment. Um, and so access to the buildings and uh, access to the rooms where some of these documents were held, uh, if they were classified or, or top secret, for us to do our assessment, 
uh, it had to take really clear planning and we had to um, make sure that we were very logical with the way that we approached this from a timing perspective. I know we talked about the schedule and how important that is. So when you're doing an assessment of a TDP, um, obviously there's hundreds of documents you must go through. Um, and so the, the, the logistics of planning that were very critical. Um, some of the things, another some, some constraints that we also talked about were that not all the artifacts were listed in the folders where we asked the sponsors to I'd put them. So what we, when we built this assessment, we met with the, with the functional leads and we asked them to identify uh, the areas that were applicable to them and their respective lanes within that uh, program. And they were to house documentation within a structure on a SharePoint site that we were to go in. Now I know it's not sexy like all this AI and you know reading everything. It's it's an old-fashioned you know grunt work. Um, and I know we're going to get to that AI one day. It's going to be awesome. But until then, uh, we're not there yet. <laughs> so um, so the artifacts that were referenced on the spreadsheet were not always stored where they said they were. They were misnamed. They were links were broken. Um, and so. It's, it's just, you know, when you're setting this up, it's really a good idea to, to identify that SharePoint site and to I really hammer home the importance of, of um, where to house all these things. Um, also, an important thing to note is for the purposes of an assessment, you must identify like a, a date or a time where you're no longer going to go in and pull data. The, the importance of that is because uh, as you're doing an assessment, there needs to be a cutoff, like a line of demarcation, where you say this is the point where we were able to get our review accomplished. Um, otherwise, uh, when you're when you're doing a, an assessment of this nature, um, sometimes the sponsor will continue to be building their portfolio, uh, and you you will run out of time. So that's uh, something to note. So we did a three phased approach to our process. Um, as you can see in phase one, uh, the government requested the IA. They conducted the TDP spreadsheet. As you can see, the green is government, blue is what the MITRE independent assessment team conducted. So after they conducted their spreadsheet, we went in, we married it up to the 3100B uh, guides, agency guides, things of that nature, and then we compiled the spreadsheet. After we compiled our initial spreadsheet, we went in and developed interview questions for each functional to talk about you know, documents that we felt were missing based, as, uh, based on our research, and then just talk to them a little bit about what we found in the files. Uh, so phase two, um, we had conducted those interviews, we categorized the artifacts by classification level and then also by functional area, and we also um, developed the TDP artifact folder, uh, made sure that that folder was updated appropriately. Um, and then also uh, at phase two is we began to out develop our outline for the tech report. Uh, on the bottom of this, uh, you can see the, how much time it took for us to do this assessment and in the reds was COVID lockdown, so uh, this was 2021. And so you can see where that uh, where that took place, and then uh, and then obviously phase three is where we did the bidders library analysis as a complete tool. Uh, we did that we uh, drafted up and published the tech reports, and then we did the final outbrief. So these are the considerations that we used when we were analyzing the artifacts and offered observations, considerations, and recommendations. Um, observations are obviously things we noticed. Considerations were things we thought had merit that might bring benefit, and then recommendations were things that we foot stomped. To, the, for, to help uh, develop their upcoming competitive acquisition to help mitigate protests. So, um, you know, the things that we considered were, I just wanna hit a couple of highlights. I know time is, is running short here, but long-term strategies compete is so important, especially when you're coming off a long-term source, a long-term sole source environment. Um, some of the things that, you know, we offer them were open architecture standards because in a sole source environment, there's usually one vendor obviously that has most of the, the the, the tools or they've been developing. Uh, and a lot of times in that sole source environment, especially uh, in, a, in a very immature program, um, those markings, those deliverables will not be uh, available for future competitions due to proprietary nature, data rights, things of that nature. So the technical data rights and rights and data has obviously always been a, the huge, um, you know, the huge elephant in the room with government acquisitions and technical data packages. So, uh, those are things you know that we really highlighted for the consideration for assessment findings um things that you know we wanted to highlight were improved upon additional information for the functional leads as they continue to get their um their data prepared for the source selection for the open market competition um one of the things that we really talked about was accessibility to bidders especially in that classified environment 
uh, where they had to uh, reserve a room where bidders could come in and spend time to go through and cipher through all those high side uh, documentation. Um, so also the utility and um, preparedness and appropriateness of the document, make sure it's labeled correctly, make sure that all the documentation were scrubbed for any proprietary markings per legal guidance, uh, checking with you know the lawyers to make sure that there were no documentation that were posted that were proprietary, thus you know uh, creating a major issue with the incumbent who was in that full source environment. Um, and then also one of the things that we did for the for the output was we created two appendixes, a list of all the data that was analyzed. So basically, what we did was we said this is what you gave us, this is what we analyzed. Uh, I believe that one the latest one we did was a 250 document um, appendix. Um, and then Appendix B is the recommendation of all the artifacts that we recommended for the bidder's library based on all the factors that I talked about earlier. So Appendix B was what we said, you know, this is how we think it should be delivered for public cons you know, consumption. Um, and then Appendix A was, was just um, how we analyzed their data. Um, so these are some recommendations that we presented throughout the, the deliverables was just to make sure that the TV requirements were aligned with overarching agency level specs and docs. We found that a lot of times the, um, the documentation did, was not, uh, did not fall within the regulations or sometimes the guidance that the overarching, uh, let's say for instance, missile defense agency has you know, overarching system level specs, uh, missile defense level uh, guidance. Um, and so uh, if it's a if it's a smaller program within that, make sure that they go through and and, and you know ensure that that documentation is uh, standardized. Um, standards, uh, and standardize the artifact file names to the TDP artifact master list. So we came up with a uh, we always recommend that they come up with a naming convention to make sure that things are are the documents are properly named. You don't want to but you know when you have so many different um, functional leads, let's say 50, up to 15 to 20 different functional leads who are responsible for specific areas of a major weapon system, you need to make sure they're talking the same language. Uh, engineers, program managers, you know, they, they don't always speak the same in cyber. So you know, having that naming convention is really important, and then also a, a list, a, like numbering system for each uh, for each document, so that um, everybody's aware. And you can instead of referencing document names, you can reference numbers and things of that nature. It just makes it more organized. Um, and then also, again, the big thing was addressing how the top secret and secret compartmentalized information programs are stored and handled throughout that documentation process, making sure that it's very, you know, making sure that in the RFI, you highlight that there will be classified and top secret information that will be needed for uh, that will be uh, as a part of this acquisition. And so addressing it early, making sure all the prospective bidders are aware of that. And then when it comes time for that industry day or that um, or that RFP, you know, release that everybody's prepared to have that the clearances and the background checks and things of that nature. Um, and then let's see. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's really about it. As you can see in the bottom here, we talked about the group of artifacts that we logically listed. Um, you know, the requirements development, design, direct directives, descriptions, interferences, software, cyber training planner. We broke those down by the functional. So um, when you when you get this TDP, it's just a pile of a mess. It's just documents everywhere, uh, you, you, you know. And so when you go in and you prepare something for a bidder's library, uh, it's just so important that it all looks the same. It all reads the same. It's all documented, you know, right dress right. Um, so that, you know, when you give a, 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 a bunch of vendors, you know, 60, 30, 60 days to put together a proposal, they're not wasting time looking for things because the better the quality of the TDP and the bidder's library, the better quality proposals you'll get back, which will definitely mitigate, you know, uh, any risks to a protest um, due to just to the just to um, to make things simpler for uh, everybody involved. So I think that's it. Uh, I talked really fast. I know we were up against the time, so I apologize. Um, I the abstract obviously goes into a lot more detail and it really breaks out things how it was. How it was broken out and uh, and and how and to to how accurately to accurately assess that uh, that TDP. So thanks. Nick, thank you very much. Um, yes, you did talk fast, but not too fast. Um, there's a huge density of of in that topic. Um, John, I'm going to send you a, a you had a question for David. I'm going to suggest that you reach out to him directly on about the sharing of data. His emails on there. Uh, 
first, let me go to the audience. Are there any questions in there? I am monitoring the Q&A, or do you just want me to put a couple points that I see on this? And um, I'm going to ask everybody get prepped. I want to ask all four of you for, um, you know, one quick sentence. What should, you, what should we think about? What should the audience think about here? A um, couple observations. Data are hard. It is, I always say in the Pentagon, data is a four letter word. It's hard to make it work across the pieces. It's hard to understand it, but it is the fuel that enables everything else. And if you are the authoritative source, be mindful that people are relying on that. It is just not your transaction. I think the other point here is we can learn a lot and each one of these researchers have learned a lot and have learned how to exploit what we have. Not ask for more, although there's sometimes access to information is, is part of the issue, but there is so much wealth and so much insight that we can gain across the department. And to inform management decisions, to inform operations, to inform delivery. And I think the third point here, and then I'm gonna go around the, the horn here for the last three minutes, is we are now in an extreme learning environment. And I would certainly encourage everybody read, learn, challenge yourself because data and information are going to be the core of our future. Uh, tools and techniques are going to emerge very rapidly. Uh, we will be working with industry, academia, and ourselves to further the mission and the nation counts on you. David, I'm gonna go to you first. You got, what is your profound statement for the audience? Um, it Focus on uh, data quality and then use your data to accomplish the goals and objective of your organization. Great, great comment. Uh, Chip, go to you. I'll try to be profound. Um, there are a lot of issues that are involved with all of this, but not all of it's technical. Some of it has to do with how people interrelate. And for example, uh, one of the offhand comments in, in back, back in panel one of this conference referred to perverse incentives at the program level, which is to say, it's not just data, it's what we economists like to think of as the interactions of people. Uh, great. Uh, Charles. I think we tend in project management to go with the PMI idea that every project is unique. The thing I've learned from looking at the data is that's not really true. Uh, every project, in fact, most projects have so many similarities. We need to get away from this idea of thinking things are unique. Look at the data and use the data to get our very alike program better. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, I just yeah, you know I just want to echo what uh, what the previous presenter said. You know, it's not a it's data in itself is not a very complex uh, entity. Uh, we make it harder than it, than it is uh, when you are dealing, especially with a data package, a technical data package. So uh, it's okay to simplify things. Uh, you don't have to try to be the smartest person in the room. You just have to get the mission done. So. Uh, first, I'd like, uh, finally, I'd like to thank all the panelists. This has been a profound dis discussion. You've, you've done a great job. Thank you for the audience of hanging in there after lunch, and uh, we wish you well.